Well, hello, disaster leaders. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. If you're you're on, uh, if you are on, uh, hit the like button. Uh, send through a comment if you can hear me okay. Just want to make sure that I'm coming through loud and clear. And uh, we've got a good show for you this afternoon. We're going to get into a few topics that uh, could could cause some some good comments and questions. Uh, we're going to be talking with. Jacob Westfall, who is the Chief Technology Officer for PZ. Uh, they're a public learning, a learning company out of Canada. And Jacob will uh, give us a rundown on, on PZ. His, uh, his video link is not on right now, so we'll have his avatar on the screen. So, But we've got good audio with him. Uh, yeah, good morning, Michael. Thanks for joining us. And so just a, a few announcements uh, before we get started. I, you know, I've got on, uh, I just released our uh, virtual emergency coordination center. So if you would like a tour of the center, uh, contact me directly at brad.eisen at hazardscape.com and uh, we'll, we'll hook you up with a, a tour. We're also gonna be running some events and webinars uh, and conferences out of that space. Uh, I'm always looking for volunteer uh, section ops chief, plans chief, any of the chiefs, even if you've got an interest in uh, practicing as an incident commander, let me know. I'm working with a couple of uh, experts to get that space set up. We are also going to be starting uh, with our ICS group coaching discovery calls in August. I've got six spots open for that. so. Please let me know if you're interested. Again, just shoot me an email directly and uh, we will get, uh, get you hooked up there. So without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Jacob Westfall from PZ. Hello, Jacob. Hello, Brad. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. And thanks for uh, agreeing to come on here to talk about public alerting because we're going to get into... Uh, a couple of topics today, especially around COVID-19 and whether public alerting uh, should have been used for COVID-19 now that we've got some hindsight. We, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, public alerting and whether or not the public should have access to public alerting. That's going to be an interesting topic. And we might, uh, I think we're also going to try and touch a little bit on uh, how Twitter was used by the RCMP in Nova Scotia back in April to issue alert about an active shooter incident. And I know before we were talking uh, on air, Jacob had uh, had tossed out the idea that emergency management is next in regards to uh, possibly using Twitter as a public alerting function and maybe getting caught on the wrong side of that. So looking forward to uh, to talk about that too. If, if you are on uh, on air, please uh, hit the like button, send us some comments or questions anytime during the, the show, and we'll be happy to get to them. Jacob, why don't you uh, first, why don't you explain to everybody how you pronounce the, the company's name and then give us a little bit of a, an intro on, on the organization. Well, thank you, Brad. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak with your audience, and and I'm looking forward to lots of good conversation and comments and, and feedback as we get into some of these uh, really interesting topics, especially during this time right now with with the pandemic. Uh, so I'm uh, with Peasy, and so how you pronounce Peasy is you just think of the words Easy Peasy. It's right. essentially Public Emergency Alerting Services Inc., and so it's uh, nice and easy to remember once you've uh, kind of got that. Uh, that, that, that thought in mind in terms of how you pronounce it. And so as a company, we're focused on providing uh, public alerting technology and services for, for governments primarily. And we do that through not only the technology platform that we have called Alertable, which is available across Canada and can be used for all types of uh, notifications, uh, whether it be an emergency or whether it be some sort of disruption at a municipal level. And we provide that service as well as a lot of the, the consulting and advice that uh, you know, we'll, we'll be, be, talk, be talking about today because it's one thing to have a piece of technology, but you really need to have some guidance and help in using it. And that's something that our company is able to really shine with because we've really been leading a lot 
of the uh, development of the national alert standards, both in Canada and the US, as well as internationally. And so we have a really good handle in terms of how you should use this technology, how it will integrate with what's available uh, through various national platforms like um, the uh, Alert Ready system in Canada oh, yeah, yeah. or, or iPaws in the United States. And so that's uh, that's really a strength that we bring, and uh, and that's really where uh, where we're at now. In terms of we're located in Calgary, Alberta. That's our headquarters, and we have right. staff spread across uh, across the country. And so the the alertable platform has been used primarily in the western provinces, and we've really responded to a lot of the the, the major disasters that have occurred. And the platform is used very successfully in Canada to be able to help mitigate some of those uh, those issues, like the Fort McMurray wildfires, floods and uh, tornadoes across the country as well. So we're, we're really uh, pleased that we're able to sort of bring that mix of technology and then experience and advice uh, to help a lot of people you know, improve their alerting capabilities. Yeah, the, the alerting at, at least, uh, you know, Alberta started with the uh, Alberta Emergency Alert System almost, uh, I think work started on it 10 years ago and it's really been, been utilized in the last uh, at least eight years. And I know you guys have had some uh, more recent uh, connection in with that, but it's, yeah, public alerting has skyrocketed in terms of, I think, just people having access to it. And, uh, you know, since the days of, you know, getting the, the, the blue or the red screen on the TV and uh, it's, it's amazing. And, and so you're, you're located though in sweltering Ontario. Right I am. I'm uh, located in Sarnia, Ontario, where it's another plus 30 degree day here with high humidity. It's been a few weeks of that. And uh, yeah. it's one of those tiring days where you're stepping outside and it's like, oh, <laughs> you walk yeah. into that wall of humidity. <laughs> no, absolutely. So let's start with um, public alerting for pandemics. Uh, I know you had, had posted a, uh, a blog post on the PZ website you know, around that question of should public alerting be used for pandemics? And I, I think you had posted it posted it early on uh, in the start of COVID-19. And, and so I'm just wondering, now that we've ha been through this now for almost four months, five months, you know, are you, are you able to give us some ideas or thoughts on, you know, its use during a pandemic? Sh should we have used it? Should we use it? What are you thinking? Well, yes, uh, definitely. So after the early stages of the pandemic, what uh, PZ did is we undertook uh, one of our surveys. We, we, we run regular surveys of the public in terms of how well emergency alerts are being received so we can you know, better understand exactly how that's, that's, that's taking place. And so any of your listeners who want to be able to um, see some of those survey results can just go to pz.com slash survey results and okay. see some of those. And so out of that, we, we found some very interesting uh, tidbits from the public in terms of what they're interested in when it comes to pandemic messaging because that's really at the end of the day you know you you sort of your agency might have some goals in mind mm -hmm. but the public has usually a different take on those right. goals right and so if you want the public to take some actions you've got to uh, adjust your messaging accordingly to make sure that you know you're 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 you're, you're targeting the the public correctly absolutely and so with the pandemic messages that did take place, there was a four provinces within Canada that primarily issued some sort of large scale pandemic alert, you know, typically okay. using the alert ready system that would have went to people's mobile devices. And so those were primarily at the provincial level and they were really targeting more travelers with a lot of the messaging. Right, yeah. And so some of the feedback we got from the public was that you know, that's nice and all, but I'm not a traveler. What do I need to do as a member of the public with regards to some pandemic actions I, uh, to take? And and so things that the public were more interested in is, is there a, is there a stay at home order or a closure from my location? Okay. Can, can you tell me that? Um, can you give me some more details about my local situation? And so that's, that's, I think, key when it comes to pandemic messaging is the more targeted you can be, the better. I think we were learning out of the gate that, okay, we're going to use this for pandemics. So let's just send out, out a broad message. And a lot of the concern in the, in the opening stages were people traveling. So it's very broad message about traveling, but that really didn't hit home with the public. What they're looking for is that more local targeted message. Mm -hmm. And so in something like the United States, the uh, wireless system, wireless alert system there 
that was primarily used at the county level, and that's just how the, there, you know there's some differences with how the alert system in, in Canada works versus the United States. Sure. A lot of counties use the system because the you know their health authority was typically uh, concentrated at the, at the county level. So the health authority providing a messaging to the public that really was uh, much better received in terms of the messaging by the by by the public because then it's targeted. Okay, my health authority is telling me this. Now, a good example, though, in in uh, in Canada, was an alert that Saskatchewan sent that was very targeted. So they had sent some some general messages about uh, travelers, et cetera. But then there was a an outbreak concern with regards to a particular event, and so they targeted the message by area so that they weren't alerting the entire province, just just the area. And then they let those people know in that area. Well, if you attended this event, you may have been exposed. Please contact your local health departments and, you know, undertake contact tracing and testing and, and other things. And that type of message from the feedback we we're getting from the public, that's what they're looking for. Those kind of gotcha. targeted okay. messages. So okay. I think going forward with any further pandemic messaging, I think it's learning from that, that, you know, the, the blanket statement probably is not as effective mm -hmm. um, as that targeted message the challenge you have with the targeted messages is, is, you know, you've got to be able to 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 refine that well. So that means you're going to cooperate with a number of different agencies. It's probably just not going to be the province saying, well, we're going to send out a message. It's the province going to have to work with a number of individual uh, local uh, agencies to say, okay, what's the message we should send for your location? Absolutely. Maybe it's a little different than the message over here. Maybe a little different than the message over there. But that's going to be what the public is looking for. And then that's going to make sure that they take action. Okay, and and for anybody uh, watching, I've got uh, the uh, the PZ website up on the screen here. There's the uh, COVID nineteen public notices and communications, and this is where you can find uh, some of that uh, survey information. So if if you're on their website, please uh, please take a look at that. And and so I wonder, um, Jacob, you mentioned that there is a desire to have that local targeted communication. Do you, and like, I don't, I'm not asking you to, to judge this, but I, I wonder about what is the, the capacity and expertise at the local level to get those messages right during the, the thick of it when maybe even governments don't have the messaging right? And, and what's the risk with that? Well, um, I, I, don't, I don't know that there's a significant risk per se for the local level because I, I'm, I'm sort of talking sort of uh, based on some analysis of use of like the, the alert ready system you know the wireless alerts those types of things right. okay. most municipalities were also using their own local systems to issue okay uh, well and so okay. the public really doesn't discern sometimes between the two right because if yeah. if, if I'm getting uh, say an email or a tweet or you know some other some other distribution method from my local municipality that's sometimes you know, the, from the public's perspective, it's all government to me, right? right whether, it sure. comes, whether it comes through my phone as alert ready or it comes through an email or it's, I hear it on the radio uh, with the mayor talking. That's right. all, all that type of messaging to me. And so I think out of the gate, there was a little bit of a challenge with regards to some of those local municipalities in terms of how best to message. But I think yeah. they learned quite quickly. Um, and, and that was some of the feedback we got that, Okay, I'm getting some really good updates from my local municipalities because they can, you know, they, they can give me that on the ground message. Yeah. And I know a lot of the, um, the municipal associations at, by the province level, as well as some mm -hmm. of the municipal associations in the United States, they were helping all the members by saying, well, here's what you need to say. And here's okay. how you can best message out to your, your, your population. So even yeah. though that first, you know, week or two might have been, you, mean, you, you know, you need the health experts at the pandemic level who maybe know what to say. They're the ones who made that messaging at the beginning. After it sort of filters down to, to the local level after a couple of weeks, I think by then the local folks were absolutely knowing what to say and, right. when, and, and getting that feedback from the public, you know, what message is resonating with them. Do you, do you guys get any metrics or, or stats real time about, you know, the reach? So if a, if a message is sent how many people get it and engage with it? So 
Yeah, yeah, it depends on what platform is sort of being used to, to distribute okay. the messages. Uh, so certainly within the Alertable platform, we have very detailed metrics in terms of what types of messages go, what channel, how many smart pe how many people get it on smart speaker, how many get it on a mobile phone, how many have seen it on a website, how many get it SMS, email, other methods like that. Um, so we have oh, very you detailed can even stats. so you could even tell if it's on like a if it comes over a Google a Google Home or a Amazon. Exactly. Speaker? Yes. Oh, okay, that's yes. cool. So we're able to do that within our platform. Then there are other uh, other other platform providers out there as well that have some some measure stats, but they're not typically shared. Uh, so we, we we do try to share our stats widely yeah. as as we do with these surveys. Yeah. Others don't have the shares there. Um, some of the social media platforms you can do some analysis there, and and we have in terms of uh, public posts, how many people are seeing it and commenting, and that that sort of analysis is available. Oh wow! But once you get into things like radio, television, or wireless alerts. Yeah, they are one way only, and there is no way to really know um, how many people have received your message through those channels. And that's one of the downsides of the type of technology that was chosen in North America for how to publish alerts yeah. uh, through those is you can get out really fast because it's just this one way broadcast of these messages, but you have no idea who's received it on oh, the other okay. end. And that's why we run these types of surveys afterwards is, okay, did you receive it? You know, and, and, and was there was a was there potential maybe to improve the message or did you run into some difficulties? And so that is really the challenge is we don't have the metrics there, but it, you know, you have to you have to use third party methods like we do with with a survey follow up to that. So where are there examples of, of countries that are using the technology where they can get that data on radio broadcast, that one way broadcast? Not on radio, but there are other technologies for how to send uh, wireless alerts to mobile devices. Uh, and so those countries that are using a different technology are able to see exactly, you know, there's 15 devices received it in this area, 20 received it here, they opened it, you know, that, that type of capability is there. Wow. Um, but the challenge you run into with that technology, you know, everything's always a, a trade-off is sometimes that technology is not as fast to get out because now they're tar you're targeting individual devices rather than just doing a broad scale um, a wide area uh, alert that okay. can go out immediately. So yeah. every technology sort of has its upsides and downsides. Uh, and that was one of the recognized uh, downsides of using the what's called cell broadcast technology yeah. in North America. It's fast. It's great for getting to lots of people, but you, it's a blast. You don't know if it went out. Do you does that does that data get shared with uh, emergency operations centers, emergency coordination centers, real time, to, so they know how many might be in an impacted area? No. Uh, interestingly enough, when alerts usually go out, um, there is not a lot of coordination that takes place with 911 centers or others. And that's something that, you know, has been also an identified shortcoming is that when you send out an emergency alert, guess who's going to get the phone calls? Yeah. 911 center. They're going to get exactly. overloaded. So, yeah. you, know, you know, an Amber Alert goes out and that may be, you know, one police jurisdiction who said, we're crafting this and we're going to issue it. And if they haven't coordinated with all the other police jurisdictions or whoever's operating the 911 centers, well, guess what? You're going to flood those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that would be cool to uh, know, you know, real time, you know, how many people are getting these alerts over what technology uh, based on, and that that could essentially be an overlay over uh, like some GIS mapping. Oh yes, yeah, and, like and that. yeah, and that capability is available in platforms like ours, uh, okay. where you have that again that control, that feedback, and and control mechanism to be able to understand what's happening when you issue your alerts. Okay. But for some of the widespread ones, like radio, TV, wireless alerts, yeah, you know, some of those others, it's it's very difficult to, to again under have that understanding. Okay. So if you're just joining us uh, live on LinkedIn, uh, I'm talking to Jacob Westfall. He is the Chief Technology Officer for PISA, uh, PZ, sorry, PZ Public Emergency Alerting, just like easy peasy. And we're right now we were just talking about uh, COVID, using public alerting for COVID-19 and and how that how that can work. Um, so the other area I wanted to really dig into is uh, you know, should the public have access to public alerting? Because again, you had posted a uh, uh, a blog post on this question, and so I, you know, I don't know if I have an opinion. Like, I mean, I can see the risk in it. I I would love 
to think that people could be responsible enough to issue their own alerts, but I don't know if if it's possible for the the larger society. Oh no, yeah, there's definitely concerns, as, yeah. as you say. Um, but I'll, maybe I'll start with the benefits because sure. I, I do see some benefits there. Yep. Um, so typically, with with a lot of emergencies, the public is going to be the first responder. You know, right. there, you know, so so there's uh, maybe a large uh, accident on a highway. They're going to be the ones who are maybe you know helping someone out of a vehicle, um, or, or other other cases. And then of course, if they can prevent any 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 follow up accidents by other, you know letting the people behind them know you know slow down, stop, it's it's a whiteout or you know something along those lines. So yeah. other things like a forest fire, they're probably going to see the smoke, smell it, or, uh, before anyone else will. So there, there's a lot of cases where the public is that sort of first responder yep. slash first um, noticer, first reporter, right? Who are then going to be able to pass that information along to, to authorities to then be able to take appropriate action. Right. So the idea is that if the public can do a better job of uh, alerting not only authorities, but also um, others who might be in danger, then you can, you know, that, that the, the faster that can take place means the more lives can be saved, right? Right. If, if, if you know, this river is flooded and uh, I want to let everyone know downstream it's coming your way, that can save lives. But the challenge is, yes, how to do that effectively and appropriately uh, considering all of the all of the concerns. And I did outline some of them in my in my blog post. You know, the idea of abuse is absolutely top yeah. of mind. Uh, you know, there's a lot of malicious actors out there who would love to misuse the system. Uh, you know, a good example is like swatting, where people call the, the SWAT department on someone's house and everyone shows up. That, you know, that's that's a real abuse of the system as well as, you know, that could certainly be misused with regards to maybe profiling or some of the bias concerns that, that take place uh, that were, you know, very top of mind right now. The idea that someone could really misuse the system in a very negative way. Yeah, that was, that was, ha swatting was happening on Twitch. So yes. the very competitive environment. And so, yeah, for, if, for anyone who doesn't know what swatting necessarily is on, on Twitch, uh, you can live stream video game playing and other things like that. And it's so competitive uh, users were calling, uh, calling in, uh, like all sorts of things on users at their home and SWAT teams would show up at the person's home and interrupt their live stream, uh, just so, so their live streams would be interrupted and their stats wouldn't be so, so good. And it would disrupt them for however long. So, um, please, I, you know, if you're listening right now, do not call the SWAT team on me, but, um, <laughs> like, I just was amazed at that. Oh, exactly. That people would, would would misuse uh, you know resources in that fashion for the for for, for that, those types of uh, advantages, right? Like I could not imagine sitting here right now, and now I have got ten SWAT team members in my in my studio here, uh, thinking that I don't know what they'd be thinking, but oh man, who the poor parents of those kids on Twitch. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and then we, we do know there are cases where that does lead also to a very negative outcome. Not only is it maybe a disruption, but, uh, you know, where there's misunderstandings and uh, there have been, uh, you know, serious incidents uh, tied to those shot. Well, right? Yeah. Exactly. Somebody yes. gets shot. My God. Yeah. So, okay. And so what, I mean, I don't know if anyone out there has uh, thoughts or comments on it um, or if you know of any jurisdictions that might be actively looking at this, I, I can definitely see the merits of the public having access to notify first responders in a different way other than just calling 911. Because that, that can take a while depending on uh, where you are, where you're at. Um, and and so, yeah, that's a, that, that's a big one. What, so like, do you, are there any examples out there of what we might see in, if, if this were to ever go forward, if, if public could sign up to provide alerts, how would they do it over their phone through an app? Would it be through a public uh, alerting system? Uh, well, well, absolutely. On the, on the alertable side, that's something we've been looking at. And that's why, you know, that's what triggered the, 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 pod, uh, the, the posting for the, the blog as well. Um, I think, uh, where you're seeing some of the examples now is where uh, NG911 systems are really starting to come online and, and explore okay. the capabilities there, yeah. especially with being able to text uh, in um, uh, it, it, rather than just phone call. Sure, yeah. Because, I, and certainly on on where it might 
start out where, where sort of the genesis of this really might start out is um, when you're when you're looking to alert people and the public you know they, they may have either two things they might either have some information from the public side so that yeah i yeah. can see the fire or i can see the flood or you know whatnot or two the other reason people might want to send an alert is the same reason they call 911 when they see something is that they're not right. necessarily having any information they're looking for confirmation mm. of what they've seen okay. and that that's something called a confirmation bias that goes into a lot of public alerting the idea that the public is always very skeptical and so when you send an alert to someone they may not take action they're going to they're going to probably look to confirm it with someone else right and so that level of uh, confirmation is the other key area and so in terms of how the, how we can best maybe address some of the the benefits is that if the public was able to uh, issue alerts within maybe a circle of influence and so you you might say okay within my my local network of friends family coworkers others I can send an immediate emergency alert to everyone there. And I'm, in this case, looking for confirmation. Did, did you get this alert too? Did you hear about this too? And if they receive that type of confirmation back, then that's an excellent reason they don't have yeah. to call 911 now, right? Right. They, they, they've already received that. And so that's sort of a key capability is if, if you can handle that confirmation request within a, a local network where, where there's already a level of trust that's been established, so you don't need to worry that this is a malicious actor or they're doing mm -hmm. this, you know, for some other reason. Okay. Uh, you're able to, to do that. The next sort of circle of sort of influence that you might have is where, as I mentioned, the, the NG911 side might come into play. Yeah. And this is where you would have, okay, here is a group of individuals within a larger area that have said, yeah, I'm interested in receiving these, call them maybe speculative alerts. Yeah. So someone said thought something, seen something, heard something, or maybe they want confirmation because they can't get it from their local circle, and I'll, I'll sign up to, to do this. And so this might be, you know, very, very akin to having an off-duty uh, first responders who, you know, can get called to help out with something, or registries that a lot of people are establishing. You know, people have these particular skills, and so when I need yeah. them for an emergency, I can go to my registry and pick them up, or storm spotters, or, you know, similar to that sure. concept yeah. that... You have this group of individuals who can help you vet these speculative alerts that are coming in. And so if you had something uh, through something like an NG911 system, where you had the ability for the public to send these in or check for confirmation, and then you had these, uh, you know, these, these uh, volunteers who are helping to participate in that, then you could sort of handle some of the abuse and misuse concerns while still giving that that situation awareness to the, the 911 center right. offloading some of the confirmation requests and calls and other things that come in and so a similar model of this is something like uh, like Waze or some of the um, traffic apps if you've you've used them before yeah. where when when the when the, you can report an emergency you can report an accident you can report you know the traffic's really slow in this area and so that is you know, establishing sort of that uh, expanded circle of influence, but in a controlled fashion and leveraging volunteers to help you sort of sort through that, right? And, and be able to understand that. Now, that can absolutely be um, uh, abused as well. And, you know, there's some, some good examples of where people have abused some of those traffic apps by reporting a whole bunch of accidents all in one spot so that it detours somewhere else on purpose, yeah. right? <laughs> well, that you know, guy that had all the phones in his wagon, Exactly. And he was pulling them down the street to make it look busy. Exactly. That yeah. was so, hilarious. Yeah. So there's those opportunities to, yeah. to sort of abuse the system, but they but they become harder and harder to do because um, of the effort required, right? So it's right. not a case of I can just call in the you know the, the SWAT call to 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 disrupt uh, someone else's uh, you know gaming session uh, if I have to actually do some effort now. And so that that idea of expanding that circle of influence and then running it through. Um, a center, something like NG911 or something along those lines that can handle some of the, the different technologies that would have to get plugged in to be able to handle that type of information. That's where I see really where, where things moving in terms of that, that capability for the public. I don't know that we'll ever get to the, the level that the public can trigger a wide scale alert on their right. own. I just don't know that we're there yet, but I see expanding those circles of influence absolutely as, as the future for, for the public and alerting. Yeah, because you, you would essentially just start to create all these little data points through a geographical location that would be the eyes and the ears of, you know, for, for disasters and emergencies. Yes. Um, yeah, there I, I caught a podcast. There They do that. Uh, 
they're doing that to track bees is you can now get a, uh, a bee feeder or a beehive that's connected to your Wi-Fi. And as the bees come in and out of this hive, that data is sent to your computer and then out to a larger network. And so that's how they're tracking the, the movement of bees and the numbers of bees everywhere. So I could see this being quite similar in a, in a local area, you've got, you know, hikers and bikers and drivers and walkers and all these people out there, you're just collecting all this data. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah their yeah. observations as well as their, their sort of confirmation requests. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Right. And, you know, the more confirmation quests, similar to the, the, the bees issue is the more you, the more data points you have, yeah. the more the stronger likelihood that that is actual an actual alert. Yeah, because you could even like people could even start to submit photos of what they're seeing uh, that, that could eventually be fed back into the 911 center and even passed on to uh, a fire chief's phone or a police, you know, in a local community, a small area or a director of emergency management just for them to see what's going on. Yes. Real time. Like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. OK, well, um, yeah, I'm going to have to think about that one a little bit because that the opportunity there is significant. So that that kind of changes my mind a little bit, leaning more towards uh, seeing it workable for the public to have have access access to that technology. Um, so if you have any thoughts or comments, please uh, or questions, please put them in the comments section in this post. Talking to Jacob Westfall from PZ Public Emergency Alerting. The one other thing I wanted to touch base on, Jacob, is, you know, here in Canada, uh, the uh, back in April, the RCMP uh, used Twitter as an initial publicly public emergency alert channel uh, to notify residents of a, an active shooter in central Nova Scotia, which resulted in uh, the death of uh, I think one RCMP officer at least. I don't know if you've got, I can't, uh, I had the information up. I think it was one RCMP officer and, uh, and that was around April 18th and 19th. And you mentioned off air, Jacob, that, you know, emergency management could be next in terms of, you know, someone using Twitter to send out a public alert and, Things go wrong, and there is backlash over that. So, what what uh, what are you forecasting could occur? Yes, it's an excellent question, and I think the a lot of the criticisms coming through right now is um, that the the police were relying on a single platform to issue right. their alert, and I think there's that's part of the recognition in today's day and age. There are many platforms available. And so if you're not alerting on a wide variety of platforms, you're absolutely missing, missing a very large chunk of, of your population. And so that's yeah. that's part of uh, the work that PZ has done at the national level in, in Canada and the U.S. to be able to bring some standards together so that if uh, you're using a, a platform to issue public alerts, that it can go out to multiple channels. Uh, and it can, that information can be shared over and over and over again through sub subsequent channels to make sure the alerts gets out. Right. But yeah, the key, the key issue there, uh, certainly in Nova Scotia, is that you use Twitter, but you didn't use what's called the alert ready system in Canada, which is really the, the wireless alerts. Right. And the challenge absolutely for every emergency manager in North America is that you have a very powerful tool at your disposal, uh, wireless alerts. Yes. And the public... And, and certainly for the last two years in Canada, it's been available. So the public has already been conditioned through the tests that go out on a regular basis through the wireless alert systems, as well as if they've maybe received an alert for weather, which is the most common uh, type of emergency that usually affects people. The, the, the public has already been conditioned that they're, they're going to receive the alert through that device. Um, they, that expectation level is set there. And so if you do not have a plan to issue through the wireless alert system and have, no, and most importantly, not tested and practice that plan, then you're going to be caught short during that, during an emergency. And you're going to be absolutely in the situation that uh, Nova Scotia is facing or in, in California in 2018, 
with the campfire right. there where you know many people died because the available tools were not used yeah. you know so it's, it's not one of those cases where i can uh, I'm, I'm we've got an alert system like a subscription-based alert system which might only reach 20 percent if, if 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 you're doing well in terms of your signups versus the wireless alert system which can 80 90 95 percent if you're not using all the available systems in place you're absolutely going to going to be caught short and it's one of those challenges that you know you, you might say okay well we don't have access to it or we don't have an ability to, to practice or train with it the public doesn't really accept that right they're right, yeah. understanding that no oh, hey look i got this alert last last month through the test yeah. why aren't you using it so you know if you don't have access to it that that's not really an, an excuse <laughs> as far yeah. as the public is concerned well why didn't you get access to it why didn't you why didn't you take these these proactive steps and and in the emergency management community that's that's absolutely one of the key steps that, that, that we that we all do is identify the risks and hazards and then make your plans and preparations in advance and so one of those certainly when it comes to to alerting is that wireless alerts are here I need to identify risks and hazards, and then I need to be able to make sure that I can message to those risks and hazards through that alert system because the expectation has been set. It it wasn't set by me, but mm -hmm. somebody else set it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I still, but I'm still going to be held to that standard. I still have to live up to that standard, and and I and that is a real challenge. I think in 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 Canada, there's a lot of jurisdictions that simply have not taken the steps to prepare and then test those plans to make right. sure oh, okay um and then and then even in the u.s as i said perfect example with with within california that uh, you know california's had uh, a lot of history with public alerting and sure. still, did, still did not take the steps to be prepared and then practice and training uh right um and so that that's that's certainly a message for for every emergency manager out there is that if you have not put together your plan about how you're going to use these systems that um are available to you um, and then you haven't tested with those systems and and testing might be well you know i don't have direct access i have to call someone else well have you gone through that with them have you actually called them have you actually got had them go through the creation of a practice alert because um, in the us and canada both of those systems you can generate practice and training alerts with that don't right. go to the public so have you done that have you actually done an end-to-end -end test um, of that of the system whether it's using it yourselves hands on the keyboard or whether it's calling someone or you know you know working with someone else who who, who has that access in place for you uh, if you haven't done that then you aren't ready and when the incident hits you're not going to be prepared the public is going to see that you've uh, fell down when it comes to their expectations with alerting and then you'll see the uh, you know the, the inevitable lawsuits like we're seeing in nova scotia or, right. or that have gone ahead in california yeah, and it and it was uh, Constable Heidi Stevenson that uh, lost her life to the the gunman who shall not be named, and that you know whether or not the the system would have been used or not, uh, would it have prevented that that tragedy? I you know there's no way of telling, but exactly. definitely like I'm just amazed to hear that there are emergency management for professionals that are not uh getting it through their heads that they need to to train and practice on these systems and and i know like i was when i worked for the alberta emergency management agency we we would do a, a test ever so often and we'd get at least one or two phone calls from the public ticked off that we interrupted their tv show and you know that's no excuse not to do the testing but i'm i'm surprised to hear that you know, we're still having to, you know, sell the value of procedures, testing systems, and and going through the routine of of live uh, live drills. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 unfortunate, um, and and a lot of it does come down to the fact that, um, you know, it it's introduced as a national system, and yeah. so you know, certainly at the local level, you might not have participated in that, right? You might not right. have actually said, well, okay, sure. yes, I, I, I want to sign up for the national system, those types of things. So even though you maybe weren't participating in its development and rollout, the simple fact is the expectation has been now set by the public. And so you, you sort of have to meet that expectation. So it's a little bit different. It's not, it's not necessarily a mandate that suddenly come down, you have to comply with. 
Right. Uh, it's it's not written, per se. No. But it's it's certainly a mandate in the in the public's mind now that okay, well, you're gonna you're gonna do this right. And absolutely. And, and, and so if you haven't sort of thought that through and and, and sort of realized that yet, uh, absolutely, you know, I, I hope this isn't too harsh of a of a, of a wake up call that. No, you, you do need to. And and that's something that, that we at PZ, we, we do try to help through that aspect of that, that policy guidance and advice in terms of how best you can um, leverage these systems to be able to, to, to get on board with them. Uh, but, you know, first things first should always be take a look at your plan. Have you tested it? No? Okay. Let's get on a test, right? <laughs> yeah, 100, 100% in shank. Thanks, uh, Shauna. So do you know, like they use, Shauna, do you know that, or maybe you know Jacob. Did they use the national system before the shooting? They must have. They so, so they for for Nova Scotia. For, yeah, for the pandemic. So Shauna sent in a comment that says Nova Scotia used the national system to make the public aware of COVID for public info, but not in this shooting incident. So I wonder if it was the Nova Scotia government that used the system for COVID, but it was the RCMP that did not use it for the shooting. That's exactly right. Uh, okay. So Nova Scotia had uh, they had participated in the in the sort of biannual tests, and then that pandemic alert was really their first alert that they ever actually issued. Okay. Uh, and then um, that then subsequent to the the the, the RCMP um, related uh, incident with the shooting, they did issue a couple um, alerts after that. So it's one of those kind of cases of it had been around for two years. They really hadn't used it, uh, and then. Um, they used it for pandemic, and and now of course they're they're committed to going forward to using it. Yeah. But it's one of those kind of cases of you, you get caught sort of flat-footed, right? Is no, no, you, you need to have it in your plan. You need to test it now, <laughs> not 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 when not when things happen. It's like you said earlier, like the to the public, it it doesn't matter, right? The the alert was in the eyes of the public in Nova Scotia. The alert was used for COVID, but not for a live, active shooter. Like that's. That's just crazy. You know, if you if that's your perception of it and that's all you know about it, like just to think about that is nuts. So I don't know. That's I don't know. I'm still kind of dismayed that, you know, there's still organizations out there who are not practicing these things because it's hard. It's it's difficult to get the message down to the either the character limit or a clear and concise point that people can understand it. It takes a lot of practice to get your, your head wrapped around how to do that. Yes, yeah, there are limits for a lot of different communication technologies, uh, whether, you know, as, you, as you mentioned, a character limit, or uh, you know, in the case of you know, something maybe scrolling across a screen, people can only read you know, things so fast, uh, or you know, depending on if they're going to take the message, maybe the member of the public is going to take the message and then they might retweet it or forward it on to someone else, yeah. and you know, the message gets muddled uh, because of that. So you know, crafting a, a short, concise message uh, is, is, is key. And as part of that, uh, I would absolutely recommend for everyone is always make sure you're identifying who the message is coming from because even in some of those pandemic messages there wasn't clear who it was coming from uh, you know some okay. of the provinces did not clearly identify who this came from right so you get this message pop up on your phone and it's you're not entirely sure who this is from or why or where or when um, that leads to that whole confirmation effect concern of well then the public's going to call 911 hey i got this thing on my phone it says absolutely i, I got to do this this and this who, who sent this <laughs> yeah no absolutely and it's it's that same thing, right? Like in, you know, you, you have a family member says there's a tornado, tornado out the window. Uh, they look out the window, there's a tornado and the rest, you know, instead of the rest of the family running to the basement, they run to the window to check it out, uh, to confirm. And, and that, that chews up valuable time. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially in an active shooter, uh, scenario or, you know, a local fire in, in the neighborhood that that's a lot of time that's, uh, that's spent going through that confirmation piece. Yes. So when you're crafting that message, the idea that you want to have it uh, concise, actionable, uh, who it came from, so that there isn't you know questions with with regards to confirmation, and then uh, you know in some cases you may actually need to tell people not to take uh, an action. So do right. not call nine one one unless 
it is an emergency because you know there, there may be those cases absolutely like you say where people sort of flock to the emergency site <laughs> yeah. rather than take the, the correct protective action yeah and uh, thanks sean exactly uh, establish yourself as a trusted and credible source and don't forget to time stamp the message absolutely uh, and so um i also i, I kind of wanted to touch in on you know future trends like 5g is starting to enter the market any impact on alerting with with the entrance of 5g or is it business as usual so at this point uh the idea is 5g is really just going to bring all the benefits of speed and and, right. uh, and and connectivity that comes with it with regards to the alerting side of things there's been some discussion about opening up other channels so right now, when alerts go out, for instance, through the, the, the current 4G type system, everything goes out through one channel, uh, and that's why you can't really opt out of some of those wireless alerts, right? They, they okay. just go through one channel. But there's actually a whole wide range of channels available to you, and with 5G and other technology, you know, there's even more. So the idea that you, I can subscribe to get messages about this or that or these other things. So there is that potential for alerting to be able to you know, subscribe to more information, perhaps, yeah. through, through your 5G network. Okay. Um, but I, at this point, within, within Canada and, and, and a lot of other countries, the idea is we don't really want to muddle the waters too much with right. a lot of subscription concerns. Gotcha. Uh, and, and I can give you a good example. You know, some of the, the countries in Asia, um, Singapore and others, that have fairly well-developed um, advanced uh, systems for, uh, for communication, mm -hmm. they broadcast on a whole bunch of different channels. And so during this pandemic, for instance, it was almost information overload with a lot of people there. You know, I, oh, I get really? like a 10 of these a day, right? Wow. Popping up about different alerts. 10? You know, oh, yeah. You know, 10 if, a day? If there's a COVID case in this area, COVID case in that area of the city, you know, this, this these oh, my gosh. concerns that, and that, that overload aspect. That and would so, drive me nuts. You, yeah, absolutely. You, you do need to then manage some of that, that, and you can do it through, through the channels and subscriptions, or you can just do it through, through better messaging. I right. think uh, it would probably be the better, the better goal. It would better just make you want to turn your phone off entirely. Exactly. Um, and that has been the, absolutely the, the case with a lot of situations where it's just too many, too many messages. Yeah. Um, in, in the U S that was a real problem for the national weather service. When it came to flash flood warnings, they learned you know, the hard way that they were sending far too, mess too many messages through the wireless alert system about flash floods because they're, they're fairly fast moving. Um, but, and, and so you see all these repeated messages. Uh, yeah. It's a large area, but it's a fast moving event that's very localized. Um, we need to adjust this because people are getting way too many messages and they're, they're just turning them off because that, that feature is available in the US. Uh, so in Canada, we, we absolutely want to avoid that. And so that's why the, the thinking right now going forward is, well, no, we're going to keep the system focused on threats to life and property. Yeah. We're not going to really open up a lot of these channels. Where 5G brings in the benefits, though, is that ability to look up information, to, to do the confirmation aspect faster, quicker, easier, um, you know, seeing some pictures from the scene, um, you know, connecting with uh, with your within your circle to to confirm, um, looking up maybe protective actions that go along with the um, uh, the particular you know. So when I when you when you say shelter in place, what does it actually mean? What am what am mm -hmm. I supposed to do? You know, those types of follow on questions that people get when they get an alert. Yeah. So 5G will bring some of those benefits, and then also bring the benefits that you have so many more connected devices that are all telling you the same thing. Your fridge tells you to shelter. In place. Well, yeah, Internet of Things. Yeah, your, your doorbell is telling you to shelter in place. Everything is telling you to shelter in place. Oh, yeah. You're going to take action then, right? <laughs> your doorbell. <laughs> Ding dong. Go Ding dong. <laughs> shelter in place. Tor tornado or hazmat issue? Do I go up or down? I don't know. Yep. And, and like, you know, yeah. you'd be able to look that up. You know, that, that type of information would come through yeah. with, with the alert. So, so there's a message crafted and then click here for more information, give you lots of details, let you know your know, wind direction, where is the tornado coming from, or if it's a hazardous material spill, yeah. what, the, what the product might be, what type of yeah. actions. All those types of uh, information will really be flowing through with the 5G that will then, uh, again, help people take better actions faster. And yeah, as you as you kind of talked about all the, the, uh, the 10 alerts a day in Asia, like there's a lot of people in Asia and like there's probably there's thousands of people in one space at any given time. Like they're all their phones going off 10 times a day all together in the same spot. Like that's crazy. It's, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, right. I, I, know, I know some folks who yeah, 
who you know have noted that as being being concerned. But at the same time, um, there are those who, who like receiving those oh, sure. because they've they've subscribed to those channels on purpose. Yeah. They want to yeah. receive those. So so you, you it's always difficult to sort of balance yeah. what people are looking for because you know I, ideally when it comes down to the perfect emergency alert is one that's tailored just to me. So what should I do, right? Yeah. How do you craft that though? When you're when you're when you're crafting it for a city or a county or, or an entire province or country, how do you craft an individual message? Very difficult. But the the capabilities that 5G and some of these other channels bring to be able to craft a message and then have follow-on information that is more specific to the user is is that benefit. So so here's the area affected by the tornado, but here's my location. Here's the weather radar overlaid. Here's where I can seek shelter. You know, that type of information then being presented to me, that is what's going to personalize that message to ensure that I then take action. Man, like <laughs> there, there's going to be people that cannot prior, like there's people that have a hard time prioritizing anyway, but like there's going to be people that get an alert on their phone that there's someone at their door, their fridge is two degrees too warm and there's a tornado coming. And I wonder which, message they're going to to prioritize first like <laughs> probably the person at the door you know do i let them in i'm going to let the person in i'll deal with the tornado or or maybe i should bump the fridge up now so the food doesn't spoil let the person in and then deal with the tornado like oh man yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll let the person in and then and then get to the basement with them <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Don't stand on my porch and get get uh, get blown away exactly that yeah that's a crazy consideration the that, it's that whole integration of the internet of things uh and all the other stuff we have going on on our on our phones um and and then meanwhile like my mother-in-law lives out in rural alberta and she she has to if she's not standing in the exact spot at her house she gets no cell service and she's got no wi-fi and so when we are out there um like i bring a handheld scanner and you got to keep an eye because if you weren't keeping an eye on the weather, you would have no idea that anything was rolling in. There's no, there's no ability to get alert in her house. It's, it's her house is like, I, I think the pipes are full of lead. She's got horrible reception. And, and so even though, you know, us in these, you know, major cities and major hubs have all this messaging, there are still people in Canada, and North America today that don't have any. Oh no, that, and that's absolutely a concern. Is how do you bring these types of technology and communication improvements, like five G and others, uh, to 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 a wide area, yeah. to to a rural area? And I, and I think that's what we're going to see with sort of the five G and other other rollouts is that those technologies are are good because they provide all deliver the speed, but the range is a concern. So you're right. probably going to see a lot of cell coverage actually shrinking out of some of those rural areas. And what is going to have to take uh, place in those rural areas is they're probably going to have to move to satellite type service because that's really going to yep. be the only economical way to deliver it. Yep. Uh, and of course, you've probably heard uh, Starlink uh, and and others that are that are you know introducing this idea of you know pretty much broadband over the entire globe. Right. And so that technology is is where I think a lot of that's going to have to happen for for rural users sure. in, in order to be able to really keep pace with a lot of the communication technology improvements that uh, for right now we really take for granted on a phone in a, in in a urban center. That's crazy because I do a lot of backcountry hiking, and if you had a global satellite internet broadband connection, essentially what that means is if I really wanted to, I could take my phone out. 50, 60 kilometers into the back country and still get internet. Yes. Oh, I don't want that. <laughs> like yeah. I go out there to detox and this is going to, now I'm going to want to take my phone. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's a challenge. If you, if you want to get away from it all, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, some of these uh, broadband uh, satellite networks yeah. come, on, come online. Uh, so you're just going to have to have uh, a lot of willpower and, uh, and, and a button that, that turns much. everything off except uh, except those emergency alerts. <laughs> yeah, I don't have that much. Well, like, well, and I was, so I did a, a three-day hike out in Waterton Lakes to to kind of uh, notate the recovery of the, the Kino wildfires that were out there in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to some of the park staff about, because I was, uh, you know, 50, 23 kilometers out from 
any major center. And so I was talking to them about what they did for the fires with backcountry campers were out there. And really, they just hopped on their quads, uh, raced out 8, 10, 12 kilometers and started notifying hikers to start hiking back in. That And again, that's a lot of time. And when you're in the middle of the mountains, the middle of that many trees, you can't, your, your visual is not that great. You might be able to hear something coming or, or smell it, but you may not even know what direction it's coming from. So that, that's, that's going to hurt comp like, cause I've got a spot. So I, I could see, uh, you know, companies like spot having to maybe make some changes too, to keep, keep pace with people now being able to bring their phone instead of needing a, a spot or something. So that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, last, last thing I wanted to ask was, uh, you know, from your position as a chief technology officer, someone who is right in the thick of all this technology, what, what's next in, you know, coming into the next decade, you know, we're going to have virtual reality stepping in. We're going to have, you know, a lot of people are talking about AI. Maybe I'll have my VR goggles on one day and, and get an emergency alert through there. Maybe it, it can happen now. What uh, what does the future hold in the technology? But definitely the continued trend towards personalization. Really, okay. that idea that I can get what I want, when I want, where I want it, whatever oh it gosh. might be. Uh, yeah. Really, because because that's really what we've been seeing the last 20, 30 years. Uh, with you know the personal computer revolution, then of course the mobile device revolution that we're going through now, and then moving into you know the, the wearables and 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 everything that goes along with that ability to have everything connected, and then giving me exactly what I want when and where. It, it's wow. it's going to mean that we don't have to remember anything anymore, and we don't really even have to lift a finger <laughs> because it's all going to be uh, so heavily personalized and, and automated. Yeah. Uh, of course, the challenge with that is, is what we're going through right now with regards to privacy and, uh, and other concerns that, that flow through that is who do we allow to have that level of information uh, about us and can we trust them that they're, they're, they're working and on our best behalf, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want, yeah, see, like, I don't want my kids to have access to everything they want all the time, right? I want them to work a little bit for their information or at least you know, critically think about where they're getting it and how they're getting it and why they're getting it. But uh, yeah, I think we're headed down. It's amazing and it's scary at the same time. Uh, I, I like the idea of having those multiple data points scattered without a, throughout a, a, a geographic location and, you know, people having access to information. But um, yeah, it's it's just going to keep going and there's going to be more and there's it's, I don't think it's going to stop. So. No, it's going to be very, very interesting uh, future ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Jacob, where, where can people find you to keep up to date on the latest and greatest? Are you, are you on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, anything like that? Uh, yeah. PZ, we've got accounts on all of those. Uh, so okay. you just go to PZ.com. Uh, P E A S I dot com. Absolutely follow us on, on all the various social media platforms. Uh, we've got our blog up there, surveys that anyone's interested in. Uh, for emergency alerts through across Canada, you can go to uh, the Alertable platform to get all that information. Uh, Alertable.ca, A L E R T A B L E.ca. And that, that actually can give you a, a full scale picture of everything going on in the country at any given time, as well as you can sign up to all the various channels to get alerts through that platform. And uh, yeah, we can absolutely uh, connect uh, through LinkedIn or awesome. uh, any of the social, other social media channels. Uh, we're, we're pretty active there, as well as uh, we do have a YouTube channel with a lot of uh, videos that we've been creating oh, to okay. th that, that further step of, okay, well, you've said wash hands, but what does that mean? You know, when it comes during yeah. a pandemic, right? That, that ability is sometimes a, a picture is worth a thousand words and a video is worth absolutely even more. So we do have that, uh, that, that those types of resources available as well. Yeah. Yeah, Liz on uh, Liz on your end is doing a good job uh, with, you know, just reaching out to people to make those connections and and to do some of the social media stuff. So, uh, it's it's nice to see you guys putting you know some of your communications expertise into action. Uh, I know I've appreciated it, so thank you for that. Oh yes, absolutely. Great big shout out to Liz. Uh, she does a great job with uh, with keeping all of our uh, all of our platforms up to date and with relevant content that uh, you know people find really useful because that, that that's key, right? Is 
informing yeah. as well as uh, you know providing all that educational material. Yes, yeah. she de she deserves a lunch on the company. You said it. All right. <laughs> She's getting it. She's getting it. Awesome. Okay. So Jacob uh, Westfall, I would like to thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak to us about uh, all these points on on public alerting. It's you know, it's it's a fascinating concept as we come into, you know, the change of technology and all of that. And I really appreciate your time and I appreciate PZ for, uh, you know, letting you come on here and, and to promote some of that stuff, because I, I think very good work, uh, very good work going on. Yes, Liz, you're you're welcome. You've got lunch coming. Woohoo. All right. OK, well, that concludes this broadcast. Jacob, thanks again. Uh, and everyone thank out you, listening, Brett. yeah, thank you. And uh, this uh, will be available on LinkedIn, and I will have it uploaded to YouTube on the Hazardscape channel uh, within the next few days. So if you want to check it out there, there'll be some links. So thank you, everyone, and stay connected. <laughs>